Okay, so so Twitch and Pokimain. Okay, Pokimain leaves Twitch due to a rise of Manosphere content, red pill content, and other things. There are contractual things, of course, why she left. I did listen to that podcast that she put out in regards to that. I definitely want to hear your thoughts on the Twitch world, the state of Twitch, and then also uh, the Pokemon stuff. Daniela. So with Pokimane, I did listen to a good portion of that episode. I didn't listen to all of it, but a very good portion. I want to say at least like 80% of it. I didn't get to finish it yet. Um, why she, uh, where she's explaining why she left leaving um, Twitch, which honestly, I didn't really know that she had a podcast until like, our, before our last recording, I think it was um, called Don't Tell Anyone. Uh, and it's actually, I, I'm not, I'm not a Pokemon fan, but I'm also not a Pokemon hater at all. It's just kind of like, she's a creator. She's cool. She does her thing. She's found success for it. I'm not hating on it. I just, I didn't follow every step of her career. And I can't say that I know everything about her. I know that when it came to hate and backlash, she, she got a lot of it. I mean, there's some, there's some um, female streamers on Twitch that catches a lot of hate for stuff. Um, and it's like more of a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing. But when it comes to just content creators, especially contracted um, content creators, there's a lot of things that they cannot do. Like even if you're upset with the platform you're on, it doesn't matter what platform that um, that you're on. If there's like a huge group, this mob mentality that's hating on it for whatever reason, and then they're expecting you to speak out on it. You can't do that publicly, not when you're under contract, especially if you want to keep that contract. Um, and also you have to determine on a personal level, like how much does this affect me? How much am I on the side that's on that the angry mob is on versus where your personal stance is? And I think that goes for just the Internet and the streaming world in general, not just Twitch, but like all of them. Um, if you speak up, like, oh, you're praised for it. If you don't because you don't want to deal with the backlash or you don't know enough information to have an opinion on something. And so you're not saying anything until you get that knowledge and understanding. People people are mad at you no matter what. And I feel like Pokemon definitely has been at the end of a lot of that. Um, and more so on the negative side than the positive side. Because I know she's done some good stuff out there. I know she has. I know she's been in there for for um for the stuff that she's done but and you know seeing that she's she didn't necessarily permanently quit twitch um there's a lot of assumptions that she signed another contract which she has said um i believe on x and on her podcast that no i'm not signing any more exclusivity co um contracts um i'm gonna go and do my own thing and in her words be a free bird and i think i i, I love that for her um, I'm, I'm not saying that it's, it's necessarily a bad thing if you're an up and coming content creator and you get offered a contract from Twitch or YouTube or Facebook or kick or wherever, like you should turn it away. I think definitely that is a great starting point, um, and milestone to get your foot in the door because even Pokemon said, uh, Pokemane said that even with these contracts brought a lot more opportunities for her to build this community, to build her name, to build her brand that maybe she wouldn't have gotten and have that. Um, and it really is about developing and working on what your brand is. What is what is your content? And I think when it comes to those contracts, yeah, you're kind of signing over some some freedom. Um, how much of that freedom are you OK with letting go? And how much I think in my mindset, the way that I'm looking at it, if a contract was offered to me, I would say yes to it. I would be for that moment OK with the exclusivity cost because I'm going to use this as an opportunity like Pokemon did to build my name, to build my brand. And I'm going to use Twitch to get it or who or YouTube or anybody like that um, to get there. I mean, it's a win win for both sides. Obviously, they're offering me. a con Well, they didn't offer me a contract. This is make believe here. Right, right. But they offering me a contract to do something for them. And they're going to do something for me and I'm going to leverage that. And I think everybody, when they come to business opportunities, um, whether it be a contract with a, a exclusivity clause with a certain um, platform or a sponsorship deal or any type of time contract, even if it's for ads, um, to use it to the best of your advantage. I'm not saying to 
to screw over whoever you're working with, but you need to make it beneficial for you in more than just a monetary way. Like what can you additionally provide to these companies that they can have your name on on their billboard or have your recorded content or your UGC content um, be used for more ads? And how can you negotiate a higher pay or retention value or anything like that so that your name, your face, your brand is out there more? So seeing seeing how she's she's had two two year contracts and now she feels that and I think everybody eventually gets to this point no matter how big or small you are you want to venture out and do more and I think in the creative process of it as a creator um, you want to spread your wings more you want to have the freedom to be able to do what you want and provide this value and have fun with it and yes it is like she she was mentioned in her podcast it's like a nine to five job but then you don't want to maintain just that mentality of it is just a nine to five job because it sucks out the joy. Um, very similar to how I'm happy for Hideo Kojima. Like he worked for Konami for a very long time and he loved the work that he did. But as a creative, you need to be able to explore other options. And Konami wasn't really giving him that full freedom. They gave him a lot of freedom for stuff, but not what he needed. Right. And you have to think about What is it that's going to benefit you more? Sometimes it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to leave this comfort zone, but to explore it all. And then on top of that, about how she's seeing Twitch, how she's seeing this community that it's fostering. I agree with her on so many aspects of it because, you know, I I took a break from, from streaming right around the pandemic, the start of the pandemic. So it's been a while. But it's not like I haven't paid attention to what was happening. Like I was still like keeping up with it, feeling it out. And I agree with her, like during the pandemic, when everybody was just kind of stuck at home, finding alternative ways to make money, to not feel so alone. Like I know some people who just did just chatting, so they didn't feel so stuck and closed off from the world. So they did it just chatting just to have people to talk to. Um, And then that flourished into other things for them. Um, to see that kind of positivity and see this type of, you know, the world kind of coming together to have each other's back because we're all locked up to, you know, how she explained it was, I I believe she used the word regressed um, and kind of reverted back to this toxicity, Um, even to the way that they handle things. um, I can totally see her aspect. And I think, again, as a brand, as a as a streamer, as a content creator, you don't want to work with just any company you want to work with the companies that you feel passionate about that you feel has a connection to you like i'm not i'm not a destiny player but if they told me hey we want to like sponsor your content for a bit if you, you know for destiny i'm not going to say yes to that because it's not really within my realm I it doesn't will. matter how much money <laughs> yeah you will <laughs> You will. I would be like, I know the right person for you. I am not that right person. I play. I love to play cozy indie games. Destiny really isn't my thing. Um, But that's that's the same thing. I mean, you don't want to work for a company or be contracted for a company that their values aren't aligning with yours because then you're having to knock down your values to match theirs for what? I know it's a a high ticket value over there. But then morally, how do you feel about that? Right. And she's at a place right now. She's at a place financially where she can say no. And that's that's awesome for her. And I understand that some people can't be that. They be at that point and you have to make those sacrifices sometimes. But when you can be comfortable, what you value should be something that you take into consideration very highly, because that's what it's going to say about you. And and me wanting to return to streaming, which I really do. And I've been really stuck with this is what feels like home. I can't say from the bottom of my heart that I bleed purple still because the environment that it's fostered, I don't know if that aligns with me. Do I go back because it's something that's familiar and that's where majority of my community was built? I don't know. Um, That's definitely a conversation I have to have with my community. Like, hey, if I go to the red side, you can come with me. How about the blue side? Um. So I, I totally respect how she's going about this. And I'm so happy that she's kind of being able, having the freedom to speak up for it. She still has a lot of respect 
or Twitch. It's just that where they stand now is just not for her. And she wants she wants the freedom to explore stuff. She she isn't going to sign an ex- exclusivity contract with anybody because she she's going to enjoy her freedom. And, you know, she wants to create content elsewhere. I believe her first YouTube stream was on the 1st of the of February. And she wants to explore TikTok and she's seeing all these other content creators that she would love to, she would, she would love to come across and make friends with that aren't on Twitch, aren't on YouTube. They're on TikTok, they're on Facebook, they're, they're elsewhere that she might have never come across because she's there creating content and streaming just for Twitch. Yeah, it's, um, I still go to watch, you know, a lot of creators on Twitch. I think Twitch is a great platform and what they've built you know, since the Justin TV days to now, uh, absolutely incredible. They recently came out and said that they're not profitable. And I think a lot of streamers are leaving, you know, because of that, uh, the financials of the state of Twitch as a platform. So there's that. Uh, will I ever go back and create there? I've been tempted to stream there, but I have no real reason to. And the other thing with that, when it comes to discoverability, Twitch has never been a platform for that especially how things, it is a popularity um, situation on that platform. You know, if you start streaming now on Twitch, nobody knows you, you're at zero. Uh, if you have a friend that dedicates their time to leave their stream on, um, on your channel, so you can get a view or two views for however many days that they do that, you may get that love. But in terms of discoverabil- discoverability, if I can say it, uh, Twitch has never been a platform for that. When it comes to YouTube, and other platforms that people learn about you and then you decide to go to Twitch, that could benefit you if you start pointing them from those platforms to Twitch. So so there's that. Uh, streaming everywhere without uh, the, the contract lock-in uh, is beneficial for everyone, which, you know, Restream has helped a lot of folks to get discovered a little bit more because you could just get one key and that key goes, you know, to all the platforms that's benefit a lot of people. And I think that's a great thing. Um, I did listen to the podcast, um, a lot of it. I do plan to listen to other things that she's done on the podcast. I think one of them is titled, how do you deal with online hate or whatever, uh, paraphrasing there. I want to listen to that one from her standpoint as a big creator who has inspired a lot of people on Twitch to even start their own channels and even give people a place of you want to call it a, a place of refuge to just, you know, be around and listen to some dope conversations that she's had and even interviews that she's had on that platform uh, for Twitch, I think is really dope. Her YouTube is over. I don't know. I think it's like, don't quote me on that. At least two plus million um, subscribers. It could be more than that. I'm just paraphrasing here. Big YouTube channel. So why, why when you stream there, it doesn't make sense if you have such a large audience and because YouTube has gotten to a place where it has taken a lot of the great pieces of Twitch and brought it to the YouTube platform. There's no reason why someone shouldn't start a channel on YouTube. So there's that. So um, I think that when you think of those contracts, a lot of companies aren't signing them anymore because there's there's no need to because all of the major content creators in the last I would say, let's say the last decade has moved on to other platforms that isn't Twitch. When you think of Dr. Lupo, when you think of uh, Valky Ray, when you think of Courage, Dr. Disrespect, we can go down the list. A lot of these creators, myth, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that I remember some of those names, I'm grateful. Memory still works. Okay. So when you think about those guys and gals that are currently on YouTube building two, three, four channels, one live streaming channel, one upload channel, one shorts channel, and they're getting all those views based on what they've done. There's no reason to, to lock into those contracts. And I do agree with you. She's at a place now where she can make, so she can make those decisions pretty easily because she's built a very, very large brand. A lot of people like her a lot, and she has product on the market with the cookies if she's still doing that. So there's a lot of things that's going on for her. And um, I'm not surprised that that move uh, took a while to get there, but it was written because of all the decisions that Twitch was making. And Kick, I don't hear a lot of people 
I don't hear a lot of kick conversations these days, but I guess I, they're still. Yeah, go ahead. I get kind of bad vibes from kick. I mean, they weren't off to like the, I mean, they were off to a great start. They got a lot of attraction going on there and, and they pulled some, you know, decent named streamers, but like at the same time, they were also getting that traction for like unpopular reasons. And I, I, went to go check out kick i i think i claimed my name there just in case and so i tried decided to stream hop and i'm like yeah this is not the place for me i mean i'm i'm happy for the ones that are you know stoked to be there mm, not not for me <laughs> it just isn't um but i, I also want to add um about her I, I think you opened it up on the topic about her wanting to move on because of the rise in manosphere um i i do agree with that that was part of the whole regression thing of, of twitch but she also mentioned something in in that episode uh about like if she wanted to grow she would have to cater more towards the men and she didn't want to and i think i see really a lot of of women streamers kind of do that even if it is subconsciously because the male demographic is definitely the still um, the higher viewers on Twitch. I mean, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but it's true for the time being for right now. I know there is a lot of women who stream and there's a lot of women viewers, but it's still kind of not as high as the numbers as, as the male viewers. So if you want to grow even more, you have to kind of cater them. Now, how you, you know, want to take that and about what you have to do um, that will definitely vary. But I also think like for me, I like, okay, for a great example, wearing makeup on stream, I have mixed feelings about it. Because yeah, if you want to wear makeup, you're wearing it for yourself and you want to feel good about yourself. Me, I'm lazy. I think of my streaming ones, like I will clean up. I'll get, make sure my hair is, is, is brushed and I, I look decent. I don't look like I just woke up in the morning and I'm a troll. Um, but I never understood doing full face makeup. And I I did have a couple of streams where I did have a full face of makeup on, but that's really because I was streaming before I had like a dinner or an event I had to go to after. And there were those times where I definitely had a different fluctuation of numbers. Now I'm not saying that all the women that stream um, only do their makeup because they want men to watch them. A lot of them do it because they, they just, like to look good and they want to that's part of who they are and i get that but i feel some of them feel pressured because they they have to um because some of them would be like i just i just want a bare face and i want to enjoy playing games and i i totally get that too because that's how 99 percent of my streams were <laughs> like i get it so not wanting to have to cater to to men just to grow but then sometimes we kind of have to and it it's it's kind of a crappy feeling hmm. uh, so I, I don't know i have thoughts here but i don't know okay so uh, let me let me just share so i think that presenting yourself in and us in such a way on camera you should want to do that you know i think that we're presenting so I'll, I'll just speak personally i'm presenting content to the world and i think that when you're presenting content to the world you have to present yourself in a way that people aren't going to focus on you know, what you're wearing, but what you're saying, I, that would be ideal. Right. But that's not always the case. People are going to look at you and judge and not necessarily take what you're saying into account. It could be great advice, but because you don't look a certain way. So it's almost like it's, it's just the world that we're in. If someone looks better on camera because they did their hair or they got their hair cut, the percentage of individual, the data will show that. I'll, I'll just say that. To what degree? I don't know. Makeup or no makeup, haircut or no haircut, suit versus a hoodie, whatever, right? The data will show uh, what that is. And I just, I guess that's just the way people are. You know what I mean? You can't get away from that. Whether you decide to, to play into that, if you want to say that, that's your choice. But just know that that's just people. People are always going to be people. There's just something about how I, I don't have this information, uh, but although they're not supposed to do that anyway, if a server approaches a table full of suits, 
women included, right? And they approach that table differently than they approach a table with people wearing jeans and sneakers and hoodies, then that's on the server, right? Because just because they have the suits on, that doesn't mean that they're going to give you, you know, 20% or even more than that versus the individuals who have the jeans and sneakers on. That could be the attire that they wear and they're CEOs of whatever company and you might lose out. You see what I'm saying? So I think it's um, people are always going to be people. And they always say, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, but we always do. But if that was the case, if we shouldn't judge a book by its cover, why are we spending thousands of dollars to create a beautiful cover for it to get noticed at a bookstore or online if we're not supposed to judge? So so it's, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting line to definitely work through. It is. But I can understand her point of view on, on it, too. It's just, uh, even if it's not just looks, it's just it's a lot of. It's a, it's a lot of different things. And I and I cannot speak for all women. I can only speak from my own personal experiences and what I've seen friends have to do or, you know, not want to do. So I, I, I just see where Pokimane is coming from with that. Yeah, I think part of my homework is to go back and listen to all the shows that she's put out, because as big of a creator as she is, as influential as she is, I know there's nuggets of wisdom that I can uh, glean from. And those episodes, I think she started in November of 2023, I think. Yeah. Um, so Only like uh, two or three months. Yeah. And I definitely want to uh, listen to, to that. Ninja has a podcast as well. Uh, Courage does one, I believe. And uh, those are the only names that are coming up right now. But we, we have a few of them that are putting out content where they can just freely talk about the things that they can talk about when it's time or just, you know, create you know, some topics that they could bring um, different guests or their friends on to talk about. So any final thoughts here? Um, just on on two final thoughts. One, I don't think I use a Spotify app on desktop enough. So I was listening it for her. I didn't know that there was a video option. There the is. podcast is the, yeah, that was our whole is. video. I didn't know that. But even when I'm using it on my phone, I don't have the app open. I'm like at the gym listening thing and working out or I'm driving. So that's completely new to me. And I thought it was actually really cool. Um, and she has like, I didn't realize how nice hair that she had. That's completely random, but she does. Um, the other thing is too, I think um, just general, and this is going to be some, a tip that I leave, I guess, or general advice that I'm listening. I'm going to leave for anybody that's listening. Um, Twitch, this is only going to really apply to Twitch because I do not have enough experience yet with um YouTube or Facebook. If you're starting out or even if you've already been streaming on Twitch for a while and you're kind of struggling building up the viewership, getting new people. And like Andrew said, it's really hard for discoverability on Twitch. I really highly recommend that um, you stream two days max on Twitch, two, three hours, if that, just two or three hours on, on Twitch. The other time, that you you think that you have to stream five or six days, don't. Those other three or four days, work on creating, you know, content for TikTok, Instagram, YouTube shorts, put in highlights from those streams for those two days, or even just record video game content um, offline and create videos off of that to draw in viewers and hopefully a new audience from other platforms to come and check you out on Twitch. That'll be like my biggest advice to you to do because it is really hard. It's always been really hard unless you were really early in on, on Twitch to have already built that. If you're new or even if you just joined like a year, two years ago, discoverability is really difficult. So you have to go to the other platforms, create other content there. Like it's still your content having to do with your, your gaming, whatever you like and, and put that out there and draw that audience in. Um, you're going to see a whole lot more benefits than you know, streaming five, six days, three, four hours or more on Twitch. It's it's really hard. And just just put that out and network onto other platforms. That is the greatest advice that I can possibly give you. 